Gender and global politics uh, has a quite a prominent uh, uh, position in international relations theory. Now, if you're looking at feminism itself, it's a movement dedicated to improving uh, women's political, social, and economic quality. Um, and feminist theory here, the goal is to explain why women are being subordinated. And there's no separation between knowledge and political practice. It really ought to improve women's lives. Now, um, the question uh, feminist uh, um, scholars are asking is where, if you have a gender sensitive lens, we'll see that there really is an absence of women in international policy making. Uh, and women's equality can only be achieved through removing uh, these legal and also political obstacles. Uh, Post-liberal feminists are less optimistic. Uh, they're looking at the um, in, uh, uh, deeper, uh, deeper structures uh, which keeps women uh, on a par, to be on par with men in international relations. Um, now, again, if you're looking at gender and international relations theory, we see looking at constructivist feminists, their ideas have ideas about how gender shapes world politics. Uh, critical theorists, both ideas and material structure shape lives in gendered ways, so they're looking at particular international political economy and the kind of gender division of uh, uh, global uh, labor. Postmodern feminists, uh, and they're looking at that men have usually been seen as the knowers and subjects of knowledge. So they have really uh, not only been in charge, but also been in charge of explaining how politics works or doesn't work. So they have also been uh, the one keeping uh, the knowledge. And then post-colonial feminists, uh, their uh, charge will be that feminists have to be too, have, were too focused on Western women. Now, if you different aspects uh, of gender, uh, a gender-sensitive role of international relations uh, gives us different perspectives. Uh, this is a very good uh, account on gender and uh, security. So we always had this myth of protection that um, you know we ought to protect women and children, and that role is uh, given uh, to men. So we have this kind of masculine image of the soldier. That, of course, is being challenged by increasing a uh, number of women uh, in um, the militaries uh, across uh, the world, including here in the United States. Uh, we still have this idea of a militarized masculinity and, and policy making. And particularly if you're looking at uh, you know, defense studies, strategic studies, very much male dominated uh, um, uh, th these fields. And then Goldstein in this book, he talks about cultures have established artificial concepts of heroic image of achieved manhood and how war then becomes a test of manhood. So if you're looking at, if he looks at different cultures, uh, you know, looking at the Pacific, Pacific Ocean cultures, uh, African, uh, Asia, uh, that all of these, you know, and, and he's an anthropologist, uh, have these rites of passage of how a boy becomes man. Uh, and a lot of different uh, tribal customs, uh, um, looking at Pacific Ocean uh, uh, states, uh, you know, the idea is that you have to go into the ocean in, in, your, in your vessel in order during a typhoon uh, to prove your manhood. Now, in modernity, these sort of rites of passage as a boy making it to man really is only what is only left is to join the armed forces. That is really what is left of how uh, in modern societies man uh, can uh, prove a manhood. Now, uh, if you're looking at international political economy, we see this gender division of labor that, you know, that really goes back to the 17th century. Women are home-based or work in garment service, agricultural fields. This is a high productive, you know, high productive sectors at very, very low wages. So they really have the double burden of household labor and uh, of uh, that um, in the labor in that particular field. Masculinity, masculine work is for cash, Feminized work is for love. You know, it depoliticizes uh, socially uh, the necessary work uh, of women. Uh, so again, if you're looking at the gendered uh, lens of international political economy, we see uh, that rather gender division uh, of labor. Now, let's look at women in elected office. Uh, political science research here tells us a lot uh, about um, the role of gender in politics. So women legislators are more likely to introduce legislation that specifically benefits women. But they also bring much better than men at bringing back funding to their home districts. A woman legislator on average passed twice as many bills as a male legislator in one recent session uh, of Congress. And then also women in Congress tend to shift the conversation to focus more on bills and policies that relate to women specifically, looking at paid, uh, paid leave or prosecuting a violence against women.
So if you're looking at Congress in the mid-1990s, comparing male and female legislators of similar ideologies of the same party, uh, the results that liberal uh, uh, female legislators co-sponsored an average of 10 bills related to women's health and an average of five uh, more than the liberal uh, male colleagues. So that was in the middle, uh, mid 90s. Um, uh, one, uh, if you're looking at uh, France here, uh, the French hijab, uh, ban, uh, hijab ban, uh, we see uh, different forms of treatment of women in a liberal democracy. So again, if you're looking at the French case, we have this very, very strong uh, a commitment uh, to uh, secularism uh, in France. And that, you know, is that now dichotomy between secularism and personal freedom. Now, uh, so the idea here is that uh, the uh, French uh, have always been very, very uh, determined to protect uh, secular, uh, you know, idols, secularism uh, in public uh, um, spaces in particular. So in the early mid 90s, we had this max, mass exclusion of Muslim female students wearing the hijab from public schools. Uh, we were not allowed to, uh, to uh, have the hijab or any other religious symbol uh, in public school. Um, in 2004, we had a law which outlawed the wearing in state schools of signs addressed by which pupils overtly manifest religious affiliation. So that included the crucifix, uh, you know, religious uh, Jewish symbols, uh, any overtly religious uh, symbol in school uh, was banned. And then lastly, in 2010, we had the law banning the niqab and burqa in public spaces. Uh, so again, if you've seen, like on the, you've seen that photo, uh, a woman uh, donning a uh, um, full body veil, the niqab uh, or uh, the burqa, uh, you'd be getting a 150 euro fine or you would uh, get a citizenship lesson. Now again, if you're looking at uh, the left image, uh, 30 mayors across France had issued a ban in 2016 on full uh, body swimsuits. So the so-called burkini that you know which allowed muslim women uh, to go out in public and you know uh, swim in the ocean or in public pool it was full body uh, you know bikini uh, burkini a full body um, swimsuit in that case that really uh, became a uh, quite uh, important reference point that image shows how three police officers forced uh, a muslim woman uh, to uncover uh, f um, and take off uh, that uh, burkini on the beach uh, on the right image, uh, you see uh, the fate of women. Again, that image on the left in, in a cartoon and then on the right. And really what it tells you that no matter where women are in the Muslim world, they're being told of what to do and what to wear. And then again, a Muslim woman uh, in Europe, in a liberal democracy, it's also again told of what to do and what to wear by men, of course. Now, looking at the uh, elections in 2006, and of course, you know, the gender factor was very important. You had the first female presidential candidate running against a very misogynist uh, um, a male uh, uh, co contender. Um, this was uh, the uh, prediction in October 2006 and what 2016 would look like if just women voted. So you can see. And then uh, that would have been an over a, a victory for Clinton. And then what 2016 would look like if just men voted. Um, so it shows you a huge, uh, huge difference in voting behavior between men and women. Now, again, the actual exit polls looked very different. So we had a very broad coalition of white American helped give Trump a very narrow victory in key states. 45% uh, of college educated white women uh, voted uh, for Trump and 70% of voters were white and the majority voted for Trump. So you uh, see again <coughs> uh, that um, it was a really uh, a very uh, narrow um, uh, win for Trump. Uh, if you're looking at uh, how did college educated women vote in the 2000 elections, uh, you see white women overtly uh, voted uh, for Trump. And then if you look at women of color, uh, the vast majority voted uh, for Clinton. So again, 51% of white women voting for Clinton, 91% of black women voting for Clinton. And then if you're looking at non-college educated women voting in the elections, we're looking at 62% of non-college educated white women voted for Trump and 95% of non-college educated black women 
voted for Clinton. Now, uh, the Trump administration itself, uh, gender has be, uh, been a very, very um, uh, important uh, factor. Uh, you're looking at those two particular uh, tweets. Uh, the, on the left one, you know, where Trump was reinstating the global gag rule, which removed U.S. funding to any overseas organization that offers uh, ab abortion. Um, what is noted, of course, it was the absence of women in that particular photo, and even more so the absence of women on the photo on the right, with uh, Vice President Pence talking to the Freedom Caucus, a very uh, conservative uh, caucus uh, in a Congress and that was that a repeal of maternity care was a requirement for that Freedom Caucus uh, to accept the change uh, for that particular version of a health care bill advocated by Republicans uh, in the House. So again, this dealt with maternity care, and again, not one single woman was present and part of that conversation. Now, the 2017 election cycle was very, very uh, different and that we had a you know a record number of female candidates uh, running a for public office, and we'll see that again in 2018 for the midterm elections. Uh, this was one particular interesting story that uh, he was Atlantic County, uh, is a New Jersey um, county official. He posted uh, that misogynist a meme uh, during uh, the Women's March in uh, January um, uh, 2017. Uh, one woman uh, felt so, Ashley Bennett, uh, felt so offended by that particular meme uh, that she ran for election and she beat him. Um, so he was defeated by that very woman who was felt so enraged uh, by that particular misogynist meme uh, that uh, she uh, took him out. So this really stood out as one of the many stories uh, in a 2017 election cycle. Now, so again, we have... 19,000 uh, women was the number of women uh, contacting Emily's list uh, about standing for election in the entire 2016 cycle. Uh, and that was, sorry, that was 920 in 2016 and 19,000 uh, in 2017. So an Emily's list is, you know, a group uh, preparing, advocating for women to run for public office. Uh, 1,800 to 15,000, the average number of annual inquiries to she should run advocacy group. That's more on the liberal leaning uh, group. 87% um, application to Emerge America as a training course for women candidates in, compared to 2016 and 2017. And then up 60% the number of women that ran in the Virginia General Assembly compared to the last, uh, last time all seats were up for election. So again, we have 28 women, 23 Democrats, and 5 Republicans, including the, uh, the 10 women that already were serving in the Virginia Senate. That made up 27% of Virginia's legislators. So we see that the 2017 election cycle had a huge uh, gender, had a huge impact, and we have this record number of women running for public office. And lastly, if you're looking at uh, the silence breaker, really started a revolution of refusal, gathering strength by the day, and in the past two months uh, alone, uh, that was um, when time made them. Uh, part, uh, sorry, person of the year, I said the silence breakers have started a revolution of refusal gathering strength by the day and the past two months alone their collective anger has spurred immediate and shocking results. Nearly every day CEOs have been fired, moguls toppled, icons disgraced, in some cases criminal charges have been brought. So the Me, Me Too movement became a person of the year uh, by Time Magazine for that momentum they had created and for uh, uh, really, that, that uh, symbol there represented uh, for women to stand against misogyny and, of course, most importantly, uh, sexual assault. So you see, uh, looking uh, in international relations and global politics, uh, more specifically with a gender-sensitive lens, with girls and women confront explicit and subtle forms of discrimination across the life cycle simply because they are women. We have gender gaps and access to educational opportunities, healthcare. They have been closed in many countries, but you know we have a lot of inequities, uh, politically and economically, that persist. Not only in the less developed world, certainly also in Europe and in the United States. Oppression works to naturalize women's continued economic political subordination and compels women to internalize gender inequities, fabricating a resilient gender gap and political uh, ambition. Um, so we've seen we've come a long way, um, and you've seen the. You know, the election in 2016 and then what happened in 2017 
Uh, and I'd like to think that 2018 gender will also continue to play a very important role in US politics. I'd like you to you know, look now closely at uh, the questions uh, which I've prepared for you this week uh, on gender in international relations.